probably go ahead and get started. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Job 31. We'll just try to fight the elements here. We've got fellowship meal coming, which is exciting, but maybe a little noisy, but that's okay. We'll just go with what we have. Today we're going to cover Job 31, which is Job's final appeal. In fact, it's his final words in the book outside of a few statements he makes when God appears later on. But if you look at Job 31, the last verse in verse 40 says, the words of Job have ended. And so, for the most part, as far as answering his friends and giving speeches, Job is done after this. And this speech from Job is really in a long line of Bible speeches that are pretty outstanding. I don't know what you would say if it was your last day to speak about yourself, but several people in the Bible do this. They give these final last words. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy is really broken up into four speeches, and they're the last words of Moses to the people, and he says several things about himself. 1 Samuel, Samuel is giving his last words to the people in 1 Samuel chapter 12, and he says essentially, I've never robbed anybody, I've never stolen anything, I've never cheated you as your ruler, and if anybody has a charge against me, speak up and say it now. Jesus, you know his famous seven last words on the cross, and the things that he says as he quotes scripture and commits himself to God. And then Paul, we know Paul's famous last words, right? I fought a good fight, what else? Finish the course and kept the faith and Paul's encouraging Timothy hey take the baton and run and stick with Christianity well Job 31 these are Job's famous famous last words there are other people too like Joshua as for me and my house well Job 31 is his final appeal to his friends and what he's done and hasn't done in his life okay now before we delve into this chapter I want to ask you what kind of man is Job and how do you know what kind of man is Job let's start there Upright, good guy, blameless guy. How do you know that? God said it. Yeah, and the inspired narrator does. In Job 1 and verse 1. And then God says it in Job 1 and verse 8. However, in Job 31, we kind of get a peek behind the curtain into Job's everyday life endeavor. So Job 1 and about verse 5, it talks about the camels and the sheep that he had in the property. And then it says he had a great many servants. And Job 1 and verse 1, and even God's statement about Job is really a summary statement. Good and upright man, shunned evil, feared God. But Job 31, Job gets autobiographical here and he says, if anybody wants to question my pedigree and the type of person I was, he lists item by item, line by line, an itemized detailed sketch of the kind of life he lives, which buttresses our claim that, oh, Job really was a righteous man. I think as we comb through this in the time we have, you'll be impressed with the detail Job went through to show his righteousness. Furthermore, why he is so shocked that he of all people is in his condition. The things that Job did to be a righteous and good guy are just pretty impressive. So as we comb through this chapter, though, I want us to see a pattern in Job 31, and you just be on the lookout for this. So the first thing Job will do is he'll mention a sin of some sort, and he'll say, this sin I couldn't have done. He'll lead off with, if I have, and then he'll go into the sin, or I would never. The first one is... Um, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why would I gaze upon a virgin or look on a maid? So the first thing Job does, and this is going to be the pattern throughout, Job mentions a sin, and he says, if I have. And then the next thing he does, he'll mention a judgment. And Job will say, well, if I've done this, then um, I deserve everything God has for me. And he'll list in detail, if I've done this transgression, I should be destroyed. Or on one occasion he says, my arm should fall off its socket, or my wife should grind for another. He just, let, hey, if I've done this sin... I deserve judgment from God. And then the third thing he'll give is sometimes. He doesn't do this in all of them, but he'll give a reason. He'll say, I should be judged because this sin is terrible. So sin, judgment, and then he'll give a reason. But then what Job often does is he gives his innocence. So Job will say, hey, if this sin is terrible. Don't do this. If I ever did this, I should be judged because this action is so terrible. But by the way, I never have. And so this is the pattern we're going to see in Job 31. As we read this, I want you to appreciate his defense, what Job says about himself, what this says about the kind of person he was, and where this fits overall in the book. But I want us to do one more thing, and we're going to have to go at like lightning speed. The preacher went a little long. Y'all are ready to eat. We're just going to have to rock and roll the best we can. But I also want you to examine your own heart. And if you had a Job 31, what would you say? I was combing through this yesterday, and I was just thinking, Job really covered all the bases. And we'll see why this was especially challenging for him based on the kind of life he lived. So let's just start. And I'm going to break it up into some sections. But Job 31, let's read the first three verses. The first thing is, Job was committed to purity and a clear conscience. Look at Job 31, 1 through 3. I made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze on a virgin or look at a maid? 
What would be my portion from above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Question, what dispensation did Job live in? By dispensation, I mean what period of time? Patriarchal, law of Moses, we know he didn't live in the Christian age. So which one would you say Job was in? Patriarchal. Show of hands, patriarchal. Good. So Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Well, a covenant is an agreement between two parties. You find Abraham going into covenants with God, Genesis 15. Moses and others enter a covenant with God. Christians are in what we call the new what? Covenant. But Job here says, I've made a covenant with my what? Job makes an agreement with his eyes. What's his covenant about? He's not going to engage in lust. Yes, Job is so committed to righteousness, there doesn't have to be a written code from God for Job on this. Now, I believe in patriarchal times. God, they knew the will of God. Paul talks about the conscience in Romans 2, 16 and 17, informing people and directing them the right way. But Job puts himself on, on the, under this. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. I won't gaze on a virgin. I won't look on a maid. And he says, this is the behavior that was mine. He was pure in, in his sight. All right, so the covenant he makes is with his eyes. He wouldn't gaze upon a virgin. This word refers to a grown woman without sexual experience. Job is saying, I've never done this. Commentators are unsure. Why does Job lead off with this? If you read the discussion with the friends, they never accuse Job of any sexual sin. Furthermore, Job's going to talk about adultery specifically later on in the chapter. And so people are saying, well, why does Job lead off with this one of all the ones he could lead off with? And there may be some reasons about this, but I think Job leads off with this one because he's saying, by the way, you guys say I've sinned. I haven't. But if you really want to get down to it even in the most secretive of sins that nobody could know. Not even in that one have I transgressed. He made a covenant with his eyes. Even the sins of the heart, Job says, even the stuff you can't see I haven't done. And then he's going to go down through the things that are clearly evident on the outside. Though they've never accused him of this, Job just starts here, I believe, to say, even in the deepest recesses of my heart, yeah, I've been pure there too. And Job hadn't done what they accused him of doing. When you read these words, do the words of Jesus come to mind? What did Jesus say about lust? Matthew 5, 27 through 30. I don't want you to quote it, but you can summarize it, right? Jesus says, you've heard it's been said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman, now you fill in the rest. With lust in his heart has what? Committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so Jesus says, if you lust in your heart, you're already guilty of adultery. This idea of inner lust is something that people have always had to fight against. At least that's what I appreciate about Job. If Job is in the patriar patriarchal age, I believe he is, this says that inner lust has always been a human issue. And Job said he made an agreement with his eyes to fight against it. There's a website to help men, and I guess women would fall on this too, to fight against pornography addiction, and it's called CovenantEyes.com. And it gets his name from this statement in Job 31, and it's about, hey, if you struggle with pornography or looking at illicit things on your phone, you can get a partner. This provides accountability, and here it is. And they take their words from what Job says in Job 31 and verse 1, and I think it's a great idea. And if you know somebody who struggles with that, or if you do, I, I think it's something you should avail yourself to. I think Job's saying something a little bit deeper, though. Job is saying he hasn't even begun the process that leads to lust. Covenant Eyes says, hey, if you look at something, it's going to pop up on your accountable, you know, accountable partner's feed or list. But Job's saying, oh, I never got the process started. You know why? Because, and Jesus does this throughout the Sermon on the Mount about various sins. If you never lust, you'll never commit adultery. You've got to lust first to commit adultery. Jesus says in Matthew 5, don't get angry without cause. If you never get angry with this reckless lack of self-control, you can't murder anybody. You can't commit adultery without lusting. And so Jesus starts with lust. And he says, you've already committed adultery in your heart if you do this. All right. And so Job is teaching us here, get your passions in order. And we all struggle with this, don't we? Notice some sins in the Bible. What's the first sin that happens in the Bible? The first one, Genesis chapter 3, what happens? The Garden of Eden and what? This isn't a trick. The eating of the fruit. Eve eats the fruit, correct? Shake or nod, yes. But the Bible says she did something with her eyes first, Genesis 3, 6. When she saw that the fruit was good, eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, gave to her husband, and he ate. Okay, the second big time when the whole world was under sin. You've got Cain and Abel, but fast forward Genesis 6. What were those days like? Every man pretty much did what was right in his own eyes, but Moses describes it this way in Genesis 6 and verse 5. Every thought 
of the intentions of the man's heart was evil continually. It started in the invisible recesses of the human heart. That's where it starts. And then you can think about Genesis 38 and verse 15, right? You think about Judah making this foolish transgression with Tamar, but the Bible says first he saw her. I'm telling you, the eyes have it. When John says in 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the vainglory that's there, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of the vainglory of life, Job says, I wouldn't do that. Now, here's the question, and you're going to see this throughout Job's dialogue. What's Job's motivation? Why didn't Job do this? Somebody tell me. Somebody in the back, maybe, that hadn't spoken. Anybody. Why does Job say he has never done this? Look at verse 2. That's the answer. He made the covenant, no lust for Job, but why does he say that in verse 2? What motivated him? Or better yet, who motivated him? God. Job said, I can't disappoint God. Does that remind you of anybody else in the Old Testament? Situation, I could lust, I could commit fornication, and they say, yeah, I can't do this because I don't want to disappoint God. Who is it? Joseph. Joseph says... Master's given me everything. Potiphar's given me everything in this house except you. And how can I do this great evil and sin against God? Genesis 39 9. Throughout Job 31, Job's going to keep saying, I didn't do X, and I didn't do it because I would hate to disappoint God. I didn't want to make him angry. He realized in verse 2 there's a God above. His portion was from on high. That's the second part of verse 2. And he also believed that God saw everything he was doing. He says in verse 3, um, at the end of verse 2, My heritage is from the Almighty on high. You know, lust seems like a personal matter. Seems like it's your business. Nobody knows. Nobody sees. Job didn't fall for that. Job said, God, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, Proverbs 15 and verse 3. And Job used that as a corrective for himself. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging beauty. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is a nice young man or woman. But Job says there is a line. And that line of lust is one I won't cross because he says if I do, It'll destroy my relationship with God. Now, let's go to the second one, verses 4 through 8. Job talks about what, would, what he would deserve if impurity was his. I'm going to read these quickly. Does not he, that's God, see my ways? He numbers all my steps. If I walk with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance. Let God know my integrity. If my step turned aside from the way and my heart went over my eyes, if any spot stuck to my hands, then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. So Job says God sees all his steps. He has not engaged in deceit. And if he did engage in deceit, what does, God, what does Job want God to do in verse 6? He says, I've never engaged in deceit. I know God knows all my steps. But in verse 6, what does he say? If I've engaged in deceit, let God do what with me? Weigh me on honest scales or weigh me in the balances. What do you think that means? Weigh me in honest scales or in just balances. Well, one of the ways that people would cheat each other back then is to have unbalanced scales. And they were trying to do it, of course, for their own profit. And, uh, and Job is saying um, that sort of falsehood, he knows God won't do that. So weigh him and he'll see he's been honest. Yeah, you can write these down for your references, but the prophets always talk about Israel being wicked because they corrupted the scales. They were hustling people in the marketplace. Hosea 12 and verse 7, Amos 8 and verse 5, Micah 6 and verse 11, and of course the famous passage in Daniel, Belshazzar, the Bible says, you've been weighed in the balance and you've been found wanting or lacking, Daniel 5, 25 through 27. And so that's not his situation here. Job says, I want God to weigh me. I want God to examine me. Now, God's going to judge who in the end? Who is God going to judge? Everybody, right? But there's a difference, and the psalmist sometimes does this, and Job's doing it here. There's the recognition that God's going to judge you and me, but then there's the inviting God to do this. You say, hey, God, I want you to test me. Look at one of these, Psalm 17. And let's do this, this one quickly. We won't be able to turn to a lot of passages. But look at Psalm 17, and notice verse number, oh, verse 3 down through verse 5. Can somebody read that? Who wants to read Psalm 17, 3 through 5? Jeremy, you want to read it? Okay, great. He didn't raise his hand, but he got volunteer. Psalm 17, 3 through 5. Now, what I want us to pay attention to is David inviting the investigation of God, saying, hey, God, I want you to look inside and tell me what you see. Go ahead. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress concerning the works of men by the word of your lips. I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. 
There's another one of these, Psalm 139, maybe more familiar, where David says at the end in verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Here's my question. Is Job being arrogant here? And for that matter, David as well, when they say, Hey, God, check me out. I haven't done anything. Is this arrogance? Why can Job be so confident? And even David, Psalm 17, 3, he says, Test my words. My mouth will not transgress. Why can Job be so confident? As he says, um... In Job 31, in verse 6, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. What's the motivation for this confidence that Job has about his standings? Few people want to say, hey, God, you, I'm ready today. Most people are saying, hey, God, give me more time. Job's like, hey, if judgment took place today, if I'm out of line with anything I've said, God, show me. Why can he be so confident? I think his goodness is he desires to be good so bad that if there is anything lacking, he truly wants to know. I think that's it. He's saying, hey, if I've missed something, God, I really, Kevin said, I, he wants to know it. He wants God to point it out. And we need that same heart where we say, God, I want you to point out the stuff that I've done that's wrong. Show me so that I can do what? I can repent and straighten it up. Some people don't want God to shine a light on their lives. John 3, John says, Light came into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They don't want to come to the light. Job says, Would you shine it on me? Um, Job says, If he's made these choices, whatever consequences he would have, he would welcome them and deserve them. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, If these things have happened to me, verse 8, then let me sow and another eat. Let what grows for me be rooted out. Job is saying, Let my life be ruined if these things happen to me. Sometimes people make mistakes, and God will forgive us for whatever transgressions we make so long as we repent. But sometimes there are consequences, and people have all of the excuses why they shouldn't say, well, it wasn't my fault. Well, you did something too. Hey, don't forget your part. Job says none of that. <laughs> Job is in a man filled with integrity because he's just saying, hey, if I mess up and God lays down the heavy hand of judgment on me, whatever consequences I get, God loves people like that. Throughout the Bible, people that just can say, God, you got me. Okay, whatever, and whatever happens as a result of this, I'll take it. God says, I like that person. I can deal with them. They really want to do what's right. But sometimes we mess up, and we can rationalize, and we've got every excuse, and it was the other person's fault. We can justify ourselves. But throughout Job 31, what you're going to find Job saying is, he can slam the gavel down on me if I've done this. God will anyway. He doesn't need our permission, but Job invites it because he really wants to be that right. Now look at verse 9 down through 12. Job talks about the sin of adultery. He hasn't done this. We won't read all of these like this, but some of them we will, or maybe all of them. I haven't, we haven't decided yet. We'll see. All right, Job 31, 9 through 12. If my heart has been enticed toward a woman, that's the sin, if I've laid and wait at my neighbor's door, then what's the consequence? Verse 10, let my wife grind for another, let her, let others bow down on her. For that would be a heinous crime. See, here's his reason. This would be terrible. That would be a heinous crime. That would be iniquity to be punished by the judges. For that would be like a fire that consumes as far as Abaddon, and it would burn to the root of all my increase. Job says if he's committed adultery, let his wife, and then this phrase, grind for another. It could mean two things. And I think it means both simultaneously. Job is saying if I've committed adultery... Let somebody do that to my wife as well. But then I think he's saying something else in addition to this. This phrase, grind for another, it could refer to like domestic responsibilities. It's used that way in Exodus 15, 11, and in Isaiah. He uses that phrase in Isaiah um, 47 and verse 2. Job could be saying, hey, if I've committed adultery, let my wife just go into work for some other guy. Let her be taken away and let me receive the same thing. All sin is terrible, but sexual sin does carry some unique consequences. It does. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside of his body, but the one that commits fornication sins against his own body. And there's forgiveness for this sin just like every other. But Job says there would be severe consequences. What's ironic about this statement at the end when he says in verse 12 um, that fire would consume his house and burn all the root of his increase? What's ironic about that? That's exactly what happened to Job. Job didn't do this sin, but he's received these consequences. Job's suffering and Job saying, I never did anything. I never did anything to, to warrant this. Um, well, we'll just have to move. Well, let's say something about this. Why do you think the Bible mentions this sin so often? The sin of adultery. Why do you think it comes up so often? Job is mentioned in Job throughout the book of Proverbs. Why do you think the Bible mentions it a lot? It entangles so many other things, yes? Probably very 
frequent sin among humanity. It's frequent. It involves other people. It involves other people. I agree with all of that. I think that's right. I also would say it's a sin that's easy to get into and hard to get out of. Proverbs chapter 5, Solomon says, stay far away from your neighbor's door. Don't go near her. And then in chapter 6, he says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be burned? And then he says, if you commit adultery, it's a foolish mistake. He says, if you rob another man, you can repay the money, but you can't calm a man's anger after you've committed adultery with his spouse. Solomon's point is, this sin carries severe consequences. And Job says, I've never done that. All right, look at Job. Well, we can just look at 15 through 20. Look at how Job treated his servants. Well, 13 really down through about 13 through 15. If I rejected the cause of my maid servant, and then he says, when they brought a complaint to me, God will rise up. When he makes inquiry or inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who make me in the womb make him? So in verses 13 through 15, Job says, um, I treated people right. Somebody said you can tell what type of person an individual is based on how he or she treats other people who can do nothing for them. How do you treat the waiter at the restaurant? Or you're in the airport using the bathroom, the janitor comes in, or the cleaning person, whatever they're doing, the garbage man on your street, you just kind of throw your trash down. Hey, job security for them, right? I just do what I want. How do we treat other people who can't do anything else for us? Notice Job. By the way, what kind of person is Job? Not integrity-wise, but I mean, what tax bracket is Job in in Job chapter 1? He's what? Rich. Like, very rich. One of the richest people in the Bible, right up there with Solomon, right? He's very wealthy. But look at what the text says. Now he's going to move into his domestic dealings. He didn't reject the cause of his servants. Here's the question. Why didn't Job mistreat the, his employees, the servants that worked in his house? Remember Job 1 and verse 5, he had many servants. And one of his defenses with the friends, he says, my servants now, they don't even come when I call. They just don't care about me. I've broken out in these boils. But Job said, when they called out, when they needed something, they worked in my house, not sons, not daughters. But I didn't just cast off their cares. Why not? What does he say in the text in 14 and 15? Somebody besides Andy, so he doesn't get all the points for participation today. Why? Why doesn't Job do this? He goes to creation. Job says, guess what? The same person, look at the text in 14. What am I going to do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who make, make him make me, and did not one fashion us in the womb? Show of hands, you deal with difficult people sometimes. Show of hands if those people live with you. No, just kidding. All right. All right. But how do we deal with them? If we stop thinking about the great burden we have to bear when we deal with them and think more about the fact that they bear the image of God, it will revolutionize the way we treat other people. Job didn't say, hey, they work for me and they clean really good, so I'm not going to disrespect them and good help is hard to find. Job says, no, oh no. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God made them in his image. Genesis 5 and verse 1. Their image bears too. And if I mistreat them, God doesn't like when people disrespect his property. What am I going to do when the Almighty rise up? They have an avenger. They may not be able to go to any type of labor force, but they can go higher than that. They can go to the Lord of Lords on me, and I would hate for that to be my lot. Maybe you, you're in charge at your office. You run your business. That's great. And you may have people that work for you that are not members of the church. May they not see a false dichotomy between what we perfect. May we not be the people on the job where they're like, well, she goes to church. She's hard to work for, man. My job's on the line every day. He's kind of he's kind of short with people. Job says, I didn't mistreat my servants. That doesn't mean he didn't have standards. That doesn't mean that Job wasn't about his business. But it did mean that Job realized that these people were image bearers as well. Um, there are so many passages on this. Ephesians 6 and verse 9, Paul says, Masters, remember, you've got a master in heaven. James 3, 9 and 10, James says, If you curse people that are made in the image of God, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. These things shouldn't be. Remember, we are not better than anybody else just because we may be doing better than everybody else. It's not your fault. Job never apologizes for his wealth in Job 31. More on his riches momentarily, and I think a challenge that we face with our material possessions. Job never apologizes for being rich. He never apologizes for doing well. But it's never an excuse to mistreat people. Job says, everybody, my wife, my neighbors, yes, my servants too. I've treated them well. Okay, let's go on. Look at 16 through 20. He was generous to the needy. He says, if I've withheld anything that the poor desired or caused the eyes of the widows to fail, that's his sin. Or if I've eaten my morsel alone. What does that mean in 17? Eating my morsel alone and the father, fatherless haven't eaten of it. What is he saying there? 
if I didn't share with people that were in need. 18. For from my youth and from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father and from my mother's womb I got at the widow if I've seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or the needy without covering if his body was not blessed by me if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep what does Job say look at 21 if I raise my hand against the fatherless verse 22 let my shoulder blade fall off from my shoulder why didn't Job do all of those bad things look at 23 what does he say again What's Job's motivation for all of the stuff that Job does? Be honest. Are you that motivated to do what's right? Based? Sometimes I'm more motivated to do what's right. Well, you know, I'm a preacher and people kind of got expectations. And you say, well, people are going to see me and how they look. Job doesn't mention that stuff. He didn't say Eliphaz or Bildad or Zophar. Every time Job says, I knew God was watching me. That's why he's so broken for 30 chapters. God, you've been the only person I've been trying to please. I thought I was making straight A's and the report cards will come out and I'm an F student. I thought I did everything just to please you. Now, Job says here he hadn't withheld anything from the poor. This is a big deal to God. Widows and fatherless. Go to Exodus 22. Exodus 22, and this is law. these are laws about social justice and how you treat people in the law of Moses. I'm in Exodus 22, 22 down through 24. You will not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry to me, and I will surely hear their cry. Verse 24, my wrath will burn. I will kill you with the sword, and your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. The impressive thing about Job to me is, all the boxes Job checks in both Old and New Testament, and so far as we know, without any written or revealed revelation. He truly was, when God says in Job 1.8, nobody like him in all the world, he's serious. Job checks all the boxes. Go back to Job 31 and notice this play on words from Job, Job 31.16 and draw you an arrow back up to verse 1. This play on words about the eyes. Job says in verse 1, I haven't made, I've made a covenant with my eyes. But then in verse 16 he says... I haven't ignored the widow's eyes and what her eyes are saying about her needs. Job saying, I'm care I care about people. I don't use my eyes for the corrupt. I use my eyes to look out on the needs of others. And when they have needs, he says, I care about them. I don't know how long Job was rich, but based on the context, and I know it's poetry, but it seems like he was rich for a very long time. Mama Job and Papa Job must have been doing pretty good too. Because Job says in verse 18, from his youth up, the fatherless were in his company, and from his mother's womb. Now, I know that's hyperbolic there, but he's saying from a very long time, as far back as you can go, the needy were always welcomed among us. We always cared about other people. We struggle with this because there's a challenge. I mean, we want to be wise without being gullible. We want to be good stewards, and there are charlatans and people that want to take advantage of us. I'm just telling you that when possible, we should err on the side of charity and let God deal with the manipulators and do what God would have us to do with what he's blessed us with. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to give cash money to people. You can buy them cheeseburgers, and if they start selling the cheeseburgers, they're just good hustlers. I don't know what to tell you. But we shouldn't be so... I mean, sometimes we use good stewardship as a cloak for covetousness. And we say, well, I really want... I don't want to waste God's stuff. And that's right, and that's good. But at the very same time, Job's concerned about people that are in need around him. Russell? Well, in Luke 12, I think Christ pretty much covers that, doesn't he? Yeah. Much is given, much be required. That uh, it's not really given just for our luxury, it's given to help others. Uh, and how we use it, so we're going to be, uh, be judged on that. That's right. And so, n now let's move into the next section based right off of what Russell said when Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, Take heed, don't, be, don't let your heart be filled with covetousness. A man's life is not based on the things that he has. Now notice that and go right into Job 31 and verse 24. Job says, If I made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand had found much, and then he talks about idolatry in 26 through 28. If I looked at the sun when it was shining or the moon in its splendor and my heart had been secretly enticed, my mouth kissed my hand, this would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges for I would have been false to God above. Again, God shows up again. Every time Job says, I don't do X, it's because God's his Y, right? Every time. Look at this, though, in 24 and 25. Job does not trust in his what? His riches. His riches. We don't have time to do this. We don't have time to do anything, but we're going to do this. Go to Psalm 62. Psalm 62 and verse 10. 
Psalm 62 10. Put no trust in extortion. Set no hopes on vain robbery. So that's ill gotten gain. But then look at the rest. If riches increase, do not what? Don't set your heart on them. Look at Proverbs 11 and verse 28. Proverbs 11 and verse 28. Look at Proverbs 11. Solomon says, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. One more. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. (coughs) Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. Job checks all the bases. You can't go in any covenant in the Bible, find a standard of righteousness where Job hadn't gotten straight A's. Look at Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. Labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. It says, Truly riches make themselves wings and fly as an eagle toward the heavens. Job didn't trust in riches. He instead trusted in God. And here's what I meant about the challenge of our wealth and our riches. We might think that the way to deal with this would be just to give everything away. And that's one way to do it. I mean, Jesus told the rich young ruler to do that, and I believe that's because he had a special temptation and problem. But I would argue that the calling from the Bible, rather than just full-on philanthropy and giving everything away, the greater challenge for the Christian with riches is not to just divulge all of their wealth away, it's to practice good and sound stewardship. And sometimes the easy way out is to say, well, hot potato, just get all of this out of my hands, I'd rather not deal with it. But God says in 1 Timothy 6, I've given you all things richly to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6, 17, but charge those who are rich in this world. Not to be high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in God who gives us all these things richly. And be ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Don't just get rid of it. Listen, God wants the wealth in his people's hands more than anybody else because he believes they'll do the most good with it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, God makes all grace abound to you in all these things so you have it and can do good with it. And that's what Job says. Hey, I haven't trusted in my riches. I've used them as a resource. Money is a great servant and a terrible master. Job's done well, but it hasn't been his undoing. He didn't engage in idolatry. This phrase here in verse number 27, my mouth has kissed my hands, it's used by Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 18, when it says, they kissed their mouths to Baal. This is something about adoration toward false idols, and Job says, didn't do that either. All right, let's move on. We're almost done, believe it or not. Job treated his enemies right. Look at Job 31, 29 through 30. If I rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me, or exalted when evil overtook him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. Job treated his enemies right. What about his hospitality towards strangers in 31 and 32? If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been filled with meat? The sojourner has not lodged in the streets. I open my doors to the travelers. And then his own personal piety in 33 and 34, he says, If I concealed my transgressions as others do, my hiding my iniquity in my heart, because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempts of families terrified me so that I kept silence and did not go out of the doors. So Job says several things here. One, he never took vengeance for himself. Have you ever said this? Be honest. Something happens to somebody who's done wrong. And have you ever said that's exactly what they what? Yeah, you all are guilty. We all have said it. Okay, great. What do we mean? That's exactly what they get. What does that mean? Or good for them. That's what they get. What do we mean? Payback. Payback. For what? What goes, around, goes what goes around comes around. Is it all right to say that? That's what they get? Look at Proverbs 24. Some of y'all are thinking about it. It's like, well, I don't know. Is this a trick? <laughs> Can I? Because if I can, I want to amen it. If not, I want to take it back. Okay. Proverbs 24. Look at 17 and 18. Rejoice not when your enemy falls, right? And don't let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Why? Verse 18. Oh, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Now, the Psalms sometimes have these imprecations where they're cursing the wicked and they're saying, get them, God. David's doing that. Revelation 6, 9, and 10. The souls under the altar are saying, God, avenge our enemies. But this isn't any kind of selfish, like, stick it to them for me, God. This is more of a let your righteous judgment reign in the earth. And with Christians, there's an added element. And may they turn to you as a result of the just wrath that's come on them. Job says, I didn't rejoice when my enemies fail. He opened his home. He extended hospitality. And then in verse 33, Job says, and if you've got the ESV, you've got a footnote, right? It says, if I have not concealed my transgressions as others do in verse 33, if you have a, the ESV, what footnote do you have there where it says, as others do? What do you have? As Adam. That's right. And there's a possibility 
the Hebrew word Adam, it can mean just people or Adam in general. I like thinking about it from the standpoint that maybe Job is referring to Adam. I didn't conceal my sins like Adam did. What did Adam do in Genesis 3 when he sinned? He and Eve, they did what? What we got to appreciate about Job in chapter 31, Job is not saying I've never sinned. He's just saying, I never sinned and sat with it and lived with it and wrapped it up and tried to hide it. I'm not a hypocrite. I didn't conceal my sins like Adam or others do if Job is sinned. And he said throughout the book that he has. I've always confessed it. I've always brought it out in the open. I've never tried to fool God. I'm not guilty. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covers his sins will not prosper, but he that confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. That's Job. Job says, I didn't do anything. All right, so here's the end. 35 through 40, Job says, Oh, that I had somebody to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Now, that signature can mean two things. Job is signing a legal document and saying, Here's my last testimony. And at the same time, Job is signing off because Job's not saying anything else after this. Job is kind of performing his own mic drop moment where he says, like I said, I didn't do anything. And he's done speaking about this. In verse 36, he says, I wish I could talk to somebody because surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give an account of all my steps like a prince. I would approach him. If my land is cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I have eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let their horns grow instead of wheat, let thorns grow instead of wheat, and foul weeds instead of barley. In 38 through 40, what is Job talking about with this property? What is this all about? He treated his land well, he his land well too, and he's saying, if it's done wrong, well, let it come out against me. Is this all right for Job to do at the end? Who is he calling out here? Who is he telling, I want to meet you and let's see what I've done? God. Some people believe that Elihu's speeches, Neil's going to deal with this next week from 32 through 37. Some people believe, and there's, there may be some credibility to this, that Elihu, one of the purposes of his speech in between Job's and God's is to put a break between them so it's not like Job can summon God. God comes when God gets ready. You don't summon God. Job says in the end, well, show up and the land testifies. I haven't done anything. And it's possible one of the purposes for Elihu's speeches is to create some space in between these arguments. But Job even calls God's creation into account. And it's impressive that when God responds to Job, he answers so much of what Job says specifically. He says, well, you don't know as much about creation as you thought you did, Job. I put things in place. You've got no idea. And so Job says, I've got nothing else to say. We've got two minutes. I'm going to give us some final things to think about in Job 31, just some practical things we learned from this chapter. Number one, live in such a way that you might be able to have a resume like Job. His pedigree and his righteousness is impressive here. All the things, the poor, the needy, his family, his property, his servants. Number two, purity starts in the heart. Much of what Job says is picked up on by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. If the heart is pure, the rest will follow. But if the heart is not pure, nothing else will be. Matthew 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And Job did. Number three, he lived in view of the audience of one. Everything Job did was to please God or in fear of God. And we need both to balance out our lives. Fear of God allows us to be fearless before men. And a desire to please God removes a crippling desire to please everybody else. If it's all about what everybody else thinks, we might disappoint the only one that we really should care about. Number next, Job prioritized his priorities, and though he was rich and a wealthy businessman, he used it all in service to God and not in order to sacrifice his relationship to God. You know, sometimes people say, I will be as dedicated as you. I'm busy. Look, I've got a business. I'm important. I've got a lot of things to do. You weren't busier than Job. Job doesn't say, well, I've got so many balls in the air, I can't please God. Job says, no, he gave me the balls, he put them in the air, and I'm using them to his good and glory. Job says, I'm going to please God. He prioritized his priority. See Job chapter 1. There's God first, family, then stuff. Next, there's a time in our lament to pour out our hearts and then be quiet and see how God responds. I love Job 3140. The words of Job are ended. Job cried, Job prayed, but there is a time after we've done all of that to be quiet and see how God's going to respond. Is he going to respond? What's he going to do? And then here's the last one. No one summons God. God comes when he gets ready. And he will come and answer Job, and we'll see what that's all about at the end of Elihu's speeches in 32 through 37. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for a good Bible class.